Shalom. In this video, we're going to be reading from Matthew chapter 4. Now, this is going to be very exciting. It's a lot of stuff to cover here, a lot of good points. Uh, let's get right into it. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. When he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was, he was hungry afterward. Okay, I'm going to stop there right for, right for a minute. Now, as I said in the previous video, the children of Israel, uh, way back in the, in the Torah, way back in Gen Genesis, Exodus, um, Numbers, you know, Deuteronomy, and even in the book of Joshua, we see how the, book, how the children of Israel, excuse me, were born in the promised land. You know, they were, uh, you know, Israel is actually a, a man's name, uh, Yaakov. Uh, Jacob became Israel. It's like he, that's was his born again experience. He was born again. And he became Israel, so to speak. And his children were born in the promised land. They had to flee to Egypt to flee from, you know, uh, the famine to flee from death. They had to flee to Egypt. And then when they came out of Egypt, the exodus of Egypt, uh, they went through the Red Sea, baptized, figuratively speaking, baptized in the Red Sea, went through the wilderness 40 years, went through the River Jordan, and then went into the Promised Land to live their fullness of life. Now, Israel is also another name for the Messiah, Yeshua, okay? Israel and Jesus are they reflect one another. Israel is like a prophetic symbol or like a prophetic uh, it's almost like a parable of Jesus. So just as Israel was born in the land, in the promised land, went to Egypt to flee from death, was baptized in the, in, the, in, the, in the Red Sea, so to speak, spent 40 years in the wilderness, tempted, and then went into the promised land. So Yeshua, Jesus, was born in the promised land, fled to Egypt to, to escape Herod. After he came back, he was baptized in the River Jordan, and he spent 40 days in the wilderness, tempted by the devil, afterward to come back to the promised land and to experience the fullness of life, so to speak, the fullness of his ministry afterward. So you see it, there's, there's a, a very clear um, reflection here between Yeshua and the children of Israel, generally speaking. So, uh Jesus spent 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, again, the, the whole number 40 here is very significant. Uh, we mentioned 40 years in the, in the wilderness. The uh, children of Israel spent 40 years in the wilderness. Moses spent 40 days and 40 nights up on the mountain to receive the, the instructions from God. Uh, Noah spent 40 days, 40 nights in the... Uh, it was 40 days and 40 nights of rain, I should say, in Noah's time. And so the, the whole number 40, be it days or years, is very significant here uh, in the scriptures. So it says, after Jesus had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, just like Moshe did, just like Moses did, he was hungry afterward. Now, I find it interesting that it says afterward here. You know, it doesn't say that he was hungry for the whole, t the whole time. Uh, it says he was hungry afterward, okay? Very interesting. Verse 3, the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. So you see, the tempter comes at the weakest point. When you're weak, something, you know, and I know that many of you might uh, relate to this. When you have a, a weak time in your life, uh, whatever the case may be, you're tired, you're hungry, there's just, you're beaten down somehow, you're depressed, whatever the case would be, that's when the tempter, you know, that's when the tempter, the tempter looks for these weak points. So the tempter looked it for a weak point in Yeshua's life. So he was waiting for him to be hungry. He was probably very, you know, severely hungry after 40 days and 40 nights. And he said, you know, if you're the son of God, command these stones to become bread. Now, you know, the Satan knew, the devil knew that he was able to make those stones become bread. He knew the power of the Son of God. He knew who, you know, Yeshua was. 
you know, we see that later on over and over and over again where, you know, Yeshua encounters evil spirits and they say, we know who you are, you know. And so it's not that the devil didn't know who he was. He absolutely knew that he was a son of God. He knew that he had the ability to turn the stones into bread. That's why he tempted him. Now, this is one of the three main categories of sin, okay? If you look in 1 John, uh, you will see that John said, if you have, if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life are not of the Father, is not of God. So lust and pride is not of God. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life is not of God. So these are the three main categories of sin. If you look back into Genesis, where the tempter tempted Eve, the tempter tempted the woman, you see that he tempted Eve in the same three categories. He says that Eve saw the fruit was good for food. That's lust of the flesh. And this is what the devil is, this is the, this is the category that the devil is aiming at right here when he says, command these stones to become bread. Because he knows this is the, he's, he's appealing to the lust of the flesh. Now, I know a lot of you, when you think of lust of the flesh, you think of you know, maybe sexual lust or something like that, but not always. Lust of the flesh can come in, in many forms. It can come in idolatry. It can come in lust for money, lust for food, lust, you know, sexual lust, any kind of thing like that. But that is a category of sin, the lust of the, of the flesh. So Jesus answered in uh, verse 4, it says, But he answered, It is written. Now notice that Jesus, the Messiah, he could have he answered the devil any which way he wanted to. He could have he answered the tempter any which way he wanted to. But instead, he decided to use Scripture. And not just Scripture. He used the Torah to, to combat Satan here. Okay. Now this is, again, is another very, very important fact that you need to uh, realize. Jesus was a Jew. Yeshua or Yahushua, whatever you want to call him, uh, you know, his Hebrew name, uh, Yeshua or Yeshua. Uh, he was a Jew. He was called a rabbi. Okay. He was the Jewish man, a hundred percent Jewish, a Jewish Messiah. To the Jewish mind, what you need to understand, please understand, to the Jewish mind, there's only one way to, to overcome Satan. I know a lot of you, you know, some of you might say, well, the devil's attacking me, or the devil's doing this, or the devil's doing that. Well, if the devil's doing, if the devil's attacking you, you need to combat that by the Torah. This is how Jesus did. The Torah being the first, the books of Moshe, the books of Moses, Okay. Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, Ge Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, okay? Now, very important here to understand as well that Yeshua always pulled from the Torah when speaking to, uh, to, the, uh, to the devil. Now, we know the devil, uh, he also quoted scripture back later on, and we're going to get to that, but Jesus quoted from the Torah, Okay? He said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of God's mouth. And that is found in Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. So let's go over there, Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3, says this, he humbled you, allowed you to become, to be hungry and fed you with manna which you didn't know, neither did your fathers know, that he might teach you that man does not live by bread only, but man lives by every word that proceeds out of Yahuwah's mouth or Yahweh's mouth or the Lord's mouth. Okay? Now, again, please understand. This is Moshe speaking to the children of Israel. Okay? Or more, I guess you would say more... Uh, 
in a deeper level, this is God speaking to the children of Israel. And once again, you need need to understand the children of Israel is generally speaking, I'm talking about, I'm not talking about every child of Israel. I'm talking about the children of Israel in a general sense is a symbol, is a prophetic, um, I'm trying to find the right word here, a prophetic symbol of Jesus, okay? So, the word here is to the children of Israel in Deuteronomy. He humbled you, allowing you to be hungry and fed you with manna, which you didn't know, neither did your fathers know, that he might teach you that man does not live by bread only, but man lives by every word that proceeds out of Yahweh's mouth, or Yahuwah's mouth. Okay? Again, just like Jesus, you know, God humbled him and allowed him to become hungry so that he may know that that man shall live by bread alone, or man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of God's mouth, okay? So let's get on to the second form of temptation, the second area, uh, the second category of sin. Then the devil took him into the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, And said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you don't dash your foot against a stone. Now that is found in Psalms 91, verses 11 to 12. Okay, so the devil here caught on very quickly. You know, he uh, he tempted Yeshua. To, to turn the stones into bread when, when Yeshua was very, very hungry. Seeing that Yeshua quoted scripture back to him, the devil thought, oh, okay, I'm going to quote scripture to him too. Notice that the devil quotes from Psalm 91. I know a lot of Christians love Psalm 91, but, you know what I mean, the devil quotes from that. I heard of somebody, you know, quotes from Psalm 91, thinking that just quoting from Psalm 91 is going to keep them safe. Uh... That's not the case here. The devil quotes from Psalm 91, trying to convince that that's going to keep Jesus safe. Okay, so this whole thing, when the devil took Jesus into the holy city, okay, and set him on the pinnacle of the temple, so this would be Jerusalem, and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, he commands his angels concerning you, that, and on their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. Now, this temptation is the temptation of pride. First of all, he's, he, he took him to the pinnacle of the temple. The top part is exalted, lifted up. Okay, that's what pride is all about, lifting up. Okay, when you're, when you, pride is lifting yourself up, basically, or lift, you know, being lifted up, being exalted. Uh, And also the devil tempted him to actually tempt God. He said, oh, if if you're the son of God, throw yourself down, throw yourself down, for, for it is written, okay? Pride tests God, okay? Pride, instead, instead of being under God's word, you become, you put yourself over God's word. Instead of trembling at his word, you're not trembling at his word whatsoever. You're, you put yourself over God's word. You try to manipulate God's word or you try to, you know, you try to use God's word for your own advantage. So this is the temptation of pride. We got three uh, categories, remember? We got the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and the lust of the eyes, okay? And again, if you look at uh, Genesis chapter 3, the devil tempted Eve in the same three categories. He's, uh, she, she saw that the fruit was good for food, the lust of the eyes. Uh, excuse me, the lust of the flesh was pleasant to the eyes. Of course, this is the lust of the eyes. And was desirable for making one wise, okay? That, that would be wise in a worldly point of view, a secular point of view. That's the pride of life, okay? And so... Satan always uses those three. Maybe not all three altogether, but at least one of those three. Lust of the eyes, pride of life, or lust of the flesh. 
Okay, he used all three with Eve, and, and Eve uh, caved in there in Genesis chapter 3. Also, again, to, reiter to reiterate in uh, 1 John, John makes it very clear that these are the categories of sin, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Okay, so uh, the devil quoted from Psalm 91, verses 11 to 12. Let's go there. Psalm 91, verse 11 says, For he will put his angels in charge of you to guard you in all your ways. They will bear you up in their hands so that you, don't, so that you won't dash your foot against a stone. Here's a perfect example. There's a lot of people who like to quote a, a verse here, a verse there, a passage here, a passage there. You have to take it in full context. You have to take all of Scripture and also use common sense as well. You know, we got these people that handle snakes because, you know, um, uh, Mark chapter 16, it, it says that, in some translations, it says that Jesus said you can you can pick up snakes and they won't hurt you. Well, first of all, you need to realize that passage is not even in the original, the oldest manuscripts. And second of all, you're just tempting God. You're doing what what the, the you know the devil wanted Jesus to do. You're tempting God. You're going against common sense in taking one passage and just you know zoning in on this one passage instead of looking at all of scripture and all of uh, just looking at, again, common sense. Back to Ma uh, Matthew chapter four, verse seven, Jesus said to him, again, it is written, you shall not test the Lord your God. Now, this is taken from Deuteronomy chapter six, verse 16. Again, take, take, Notice this. Jesus again quotes from the Torah. Again, he, he uses the Torah according to the Jewish understanding of how to defeat Satan. Do it by the Torah. Okay? This is how Jesus did it. Uh, he quoted Deuteronomy 6, verse 16. So let's check that out. Deuteronomy 6, verse 16. It says, You shall not tempt Yahuwah your God as you tempted him in Massa. Okay? You shall not test the Lord your God. Okay, so verse back to Matthew chapter 4, verse 8. Again, the devil took him to an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. Now, this is the lust of the eyes, okay, and their glory. The glory here means beauty, okay? So, the devil showed him, took him up and showed him the lust of the eyes. Look at all this beauty. Look at all this glory. Look at all the gold. Look at all the lush, the lush fields. Look at all the land. Look at it all. Look, look, look. Pleasant to the eyes. The devil said to him, I will give you all these things if you fall down and worship me. Then Yeshua said to him, get behind me, Satan. Now, the Textus Receptus and the NU read, go away instead of get behind me. So, get behind me, Satan, or go away, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Now, again, for a third time, Jesus quoted the Torah. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13. Let's check that out. Uh, Deuteronomy 6, verse 13 says, you shall fear Yahuwah your God, the Lord your God, and you shall serve him and swear and shall swear by his name. Okay? You shall not go after other gods of the gods of the peoples who are around you. For Yahuwah your God among you is a jealous God, lest the anger of Yahuwah your God will be kindled against you and he destroy you from off the face of the earth. Okay, so, again, we sh Jesus quoted from the Torah. Always quoting from the Torah. Again, this is the Jewish understanding. Jesus is a Jew, and he follows the, the, the Jewish understanding. And actually, it's not just the Jewish understanding. It's the true understanding of how to defeat the devil. Verse 11, Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and served him. 
Now, when Jesus heard that Yehokanan was delivered up and with, withdrew into Galilee, leaving Nazareth, he came and lived at Capernaum, or people say Capernaum, it is Capernaum, which means village of Nahum, really the village of Nahum, the, the Nahum that's spoken of in the, uh, in the so-called Old Testament, the prophet Nahum. Uh, that was the home of Nahum the prophet, which is by the sea in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken through the prof- through Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, toward the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness saw a great light. Those who sat in the region and and shadow of death, to them light has dawned. Now that is Isaiah chapter 9, verses 1 and 2. So finally, let's go to Isaiah chapter 9. Verse 1, But there shall be no more gloom for her who was in anguish in the former time. He brought, he brought in contempt into contempt, the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. But in the latter time, he was made. He has made it glorious by the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the of the of the nations. Verse two: The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. The light has shined on them, on those who lived in the land of the shadow of death. Now, once again, I say this. I said this several times that when you see one passage of Scripture quoting another passage of Scripture. It's almost always not verbatim. Uh, Today, in this day and age, we're really focused on, you know, quoting things verbatim, get every single letter right, get every single word right, get everything right. Back in those days, it was, there was more of an emphasis on the spirit of what was actually being said. Now, that said also, there, there is loss of translation as well because we got in the so-called Old Testament, we got the original Hebrew translated into English. In the New Testament, we've got the original Greek, which was translated from the original Hebrew. So the, the original Hebrew was translated into Greek, which was then translated into English. So you see there's, there's a whole loss, a lot of loss there going on. Uh, with all the different translations kind of going downstream. Verse 17 of Matthew chapter 4. From that time, Yeshua began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Okay, so look at this. Again, this is the same message that Yehokanan, John, preached. John the Baptist preached. The first message John the Baptist preached was repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The first message that Jesus preached was repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now let me add that the first message that the disciples preached was repent. The first message in the book of Acts that was preached includes repentance. And actually even towards the end of the book of Acts, it says God commands all men everywhere to repent. In the last the last word that Jesus had to his church in the book of Revelation chapters 2 and 3, he said, repent, 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 repent. He said, repent over and over and over again to his church, to his church, Uh, basically warning them that if they don't repent, there's going to be severe consequences, severe judgment. So here we go again. Repent is the first and primary message of Yeshua. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent means, in from the Greek, it means to change your mind. Okay, uh, change your mind about the way you live. Change your mind about sin. Change your mind. If you change your mind, you will change your life. Okay, change your mind. Now, in the original Hebrew, the Hebrew, the roots of it, uh, the word repent teshuva means to turn, to return, to return to God, to return to His law to return to him. So repent is to come back to God. Now for the, uh, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, I'll just briefly touch on this. I did this last time in the last video, but I'll do this again briefly, uh, just in case some of you didn't see the last video. But the kingdom of heaven speaks of God's rule 
Okay, God ruling. It's, this is not talking about literally a heaven that's way off in the middle of you know space somewhere or way out in the, in the outskirts of the universe. No, this is talking about the rule, the kingdom of the king, the rule of heaven in your life. Okay, the rule of God in your life. And once again, you cannot have God ruling your life without rules. There has to be rules. And I know many of you think that, well, you know, we don't go by, by the law anymore. We don't go by, by rules anymore. We only go by uh, faith. We can go by grace. Well, you're making your own rules up. You know, you're making your own rules up. Uh, we got to let God rule with his rules. Okay. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. In order to obey God, to obey Him, to obey His law, it is at hand. In other words, it's right there, easy to get. You're just sitting there and you can just take it, okay? Figuratively speaking, you can just take it. It's within your grasp. As Deuteronomy chapter 30 says, it's not so hard to, to obey. You don't, have to go, you don't have to climb the highest mountain to get it. You don't have to go up and way up into heaven to get it. You don't have to go down to the, the, to the core of the earth to get it. You can get it easily. It's right within your grasp. And that's exactly what it means. The kingdom of heaven is at hand means the kingdom of heaven is available for you, easily available for you to take. It is easy to allow God to rule in your life. Uh, again, uh, I say that kind of uh, under my breath because you have to die first. You have to be crucified uh, in order to be risen with Christ and to live uh, with him in newness of life. But uh, that said, it is not hard to obey all the commands of God that apply to you. Luke chapter 1 verse 6 you know, we have the, the parents of John the Baptist. It says they obeyed all, all of the commands of God. All of the law. All of the mitzvot. They obeyed. So it's possible. Uh, you know, contrary to what a lot of evangelical Christians and a lot of evangelical uh, teachings may say, that it's impossible to obey the law of God. That's why we need Jesus. Well... You know, yeah, Jesus came to help you to repent, to lead you onto that right track. But yes, you can do it. God is not abusive to give you commands that you cannot obey. God is not a tyrant to, to give commands out to, to, to people for hundreds, if not thousands of years that they cannot obey. Okay, let's go into uh, verse 18. Walking by the Sea of Galilee, he... And it says TR here reads, uh, that's a uh, Texas Receptus, which would be in the uh, uh, King James Version and such, reads Jesus instead of he. So walking by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus, or Yeshua, saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. He said to them, come after me and I will make you fishers for men. Okay, yeah, I like the way that uh, Yeshua always aims at, you know, meets people where they are and speaks their language, so to speak. I mean, not filthy language. Of course, he wouldn't be using the language of hell. I mean, if you're, you know, you can't, I, I, people who know me know that I say that don't expect to go to heaven with the language of hell on your lips. I'm not talking in that context, but Jesus likes to uh, reach people and meet them where they are. So they are uh, they were fishing and he says come after me I will make you fishers of men. You're going to you're going to you're going to fish for men now. Verse 20. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Wow. I mean, you think about it. Now Yeshua just wasn't just any average ordinary guy here. And he just I mean, he obviously had to it's either one of two things. It was a just an outright miracle that Peter, uh, Simon, and Andrew just left everything for someone that they didn't even meet before, didn't even know who they who this person was, or they knew, they knew who Yeshua was from before. Now I know a lot of the unpublished works, the un canonized works of Yeshua's life before this point in time speaks of lots of miracles and lots of things going on. We're going to get into that again. We're going to get into that later as I read those particular documents. But yeah, I mean, 
why why else would they just leave their nets and follow him you know i have learned to lean on the side of just being common sense common sense would tell you that there was something about yeshua that people knew all about okay you think about it, even when he was younger at the at the um, at the wedding when his mother said to to the servants whatever he does obey him or whatever he tells you to do obey him whatever whatever this child tells you to do obey him so people knew there was something very, very, very special and very, very, very powerful about Yeshua, Rabbi Yeshua. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, uh, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, James and John, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. He called them. They immediately left their boat and their father and, and followed him. Think about that. I mean, they left everything. They left their family. They left everything just on one call. I mean, Jesus didn't have to beg them. Jesus didn't have to go and say, oh, come on, come on, why don't you? No, no, no. He just called them and they come. So again, common sense and looking at the the documents that I, that I referred to earlier, the unpublished un. The non-canonical documents, the, the documents that did not reach into the this mainstream Bible, uh, speaks a lot about Jesus' power and his works before this time, okay? As a child growing up, you know, as a, as a, uh, as a young man before this, whole, before this whole scene took place. So it seems to me like Jesus did do um, miracles. So there was this thing about him that people knew about him. People knew whatever he says, do it. I mean, this is a very powerful, very highly respected uh, rabbi. Verse 23, Jesus went about in all Galilee teaching in their synagogues. Again, I like to point out, Jesus went to synagogue. He didn't go to church, okay? Uh, so, yeah. Uh, the synagogues were something that Jesus frequented, frequented often, and, and also all the disciples. Okay, uh, so he went about in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, preaching the gospel, and healing every disease and every sickness among the people. Now, I like to point this out as well: um, the healing and the you know, healing every disease and healing every sickness, for the most part, followed his teaching, okay? When he taught, then afterwards, healings and miracles happened. Why is that? Now, I know it says in many places he healed all, he healed all, he healed all, but who was the all that he healed? He, he didn't heal just everybody in the world, of course, he healed those who were in his, his immediate reach. And again, generally speaking, not every time, but the majority of times, those people that he healed were those who were humble enough to hear his hard and harsh teaching. And you got to admit, Jesus did preach hard and harsh teachings. You know, he taught a lot about denying yourself, dying to self, and taking up your cross, and, and you, you got to deny all this to follow me. And all, I mean, lots of different things he taught. You know, the straight and narrow, few there be that find it, you know. So these people were, first of all, they were Jewish people. They didn't have an unkosher diet. They had a kosher diet. So the, the, the diseases and sicknesses that they had were not from unkosher eating. Okay? They were spiritual for the most part. And so when Yeshua was preaching, everything he preached was from the Torah. Okay? I challenge any of you and every one of you to show me one thing that he preached that is not rooted in, you know, in the Torah. Everything is. Everything. I'm telling you, everything is rooted in the Torah that he, that he preached. He, he didn't bring anything new. Even when he said, I give you a new command that you love one another, that's from the Torah. You know, so you love your neighbor as yourself. You know, love, and there's lots of teachings in the Torah about loving your neighbor and loving one another and such, okay? So the people that were healed were those who repented, 
Those who, those who heard his hard and harsh teachings were humble enough to stay, stick around and were humble enough to repent. I mean, how can you not repent uh, in that kind of an atmosphere and hearing that kind of teaching? Okay. Uh, so, yeah, that's, I mean, I see people today, you know, these healing evangelists, uh, televangelists standing before lots of people saying, oh, God, let this be the, this, let this be the service where everybody, everybody gets healed. Well, it's not going to happen unless you, first of all, make sure everybody eats kosher. And then, and then when you preach, preach the hard and the, preach the truth str- and preach straight. Preach Torah like Jesus preached. Preach it straight. Preach it hard. People are going to walk away. I'm sure lots of people walked away when Jesus, even a lot of his disciples walked away. At one point in time, it says he had 70 disciples, you know, and, uh, you know, 58 of them walked away. So, yeah, a lot of people are going to walk away. But the people that stick around are the ones that are going to be uh, healed, okay? Verse 24, the report about him went out into all Syria, they brought to him all who were sick, afflicted with various diseases and torments, possessed with demons, epileptics, and para- paralytics, and he healed them. Great multitudes from Galilee, Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and from beyond the Jordan followed him. So, yes, um, great and mighty miracles were done by Yeshua, and... Uh, it was done. He didn't do it just to put on a show. Many times, and we're going to read this as we go through the Gospels. Many times, he 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 warned people. He, he told people, "Don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody. You know about your healing, about your miracle. You know he didn't want he didn't want to have the spotlight on him, so to speak. He didn't do it for fame. He didn't do it just for himself. He didn't do it to build his ministry. He did it because it was a, it was the natural." Um, uh, product of people who heard the teaching, righteous teaching, hard teaching, repentance, and people who actually repented. And uh, they repented and they were healed. I, I, I told you, I, I've seen it before in my life. When people repent, a lot of times they get healed without, without even asking for healing. I saw that, I, I saw that happen in my life, okay? Um, you repent, you, te- you, you teach others, other people to repent. A lot of times, their sicknesses, their diseases disappear with their sin. Okay? So, thanks again for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to check again uh, for another video as I'm going to be making all these videos. Uh, I'm going to try to get them out as fast as possible. So, thank you and may may God give you a, a spirit of understanding. Open your mind to understand the scriptures that I read and uh, to be enlightened and to be incredibly blessed by these videos. Thanks again.